Hi, yep, can you hear me? We hear you just fine, so uh, you'll be able to present now. Great. Well, good evening, or good noon. I'm uh, presenting from Michigan, where it's um, just after 7.30 here. So it's uh, to be with you, and I'm excited about sharing um, what I've learned about collaboration um, in classrooms over the last few years as I've dabbled with um, those uh, products and um, just various um, products in my own classroom. Um, just in, um, by sharing a couple of resources with you, um, the site that you should see right now, it's got the big collaboration in the cloud at the top. This is a Canyon Google site that I've set up that contains all of the links, um, examples, uh, resources, even includes my presentation. And you can ask this um, at any time. I'll leave it up. Um, feel free to uh, use and read anything that you find here. The, um, the short URL was up here um, before I began. You can also ask, access this at bit.ly slash STEM collaboration. Um, and uh, I'll put that, we'll put that screen up back at the end of the, uh, the webinar as well. I urge you, if, if um, you're able to pull it up, and you can kind of find um, as I to um, uh, follow along uh, right with um, what you see there. I'm going to switch over to my um, presentation. Yeah, we'll get started here. A little bit about myself, first of all. Um, my name is uh, John Sowash, and I teach um, biology, anatomy and physiology, AP biology at Southfield Christian School, um, which is located just outside of Detroit in Michigan. You can see my contact information there. You're welcome to reach out to me if um, you'd like to, either via email or or also on my blog. Um, I have uh, two kids. You can see a picture of us last year here. Um, I have a two-year-old daughter named Janelle and um, an eight-year-old son. And, um, in addition to teaching full-time at Southfield Christian School, I also teach part-time at a virtual school called the Oaks Virtual Academy. And as I mentioned previously, I'm a Google certified teacher and a Google Apps certified trainer. So just a little about me. Here's the uh, URL to the website that uh, you're welcome to access at any time. And it's kind of fun as I go through today. And I've also got a uh, short survey up there that if <clears throat> you can go ahead and take that, just give me some a better idea of who you are and how I can uh, meet your needs. And um, uh, even more information after this webinar is over. So let's start it. I'd like to address some big questions. Uh, the first one. Why should we even have this discussion? Um, why is collaboration important? And I'd like to present um, three or four ways that, um, reasons that I think collaboration is very, very important. First of all, collaborate how things get done. And have um, developing your professional career, I'm sure that you have realized that um, any technical uh, job or um, complicated task requires more than a person working on it. And when we collaborate, we are able to achieve more. And that leads into the second uh, reason why collaboration is important. There's more than one brain is always better. Different perspectives, different um, ideas, different ways of approaching a problem uh, rounds out um, the team and helps us to be more efficient. Collaboration enables uh, new perspectives in terms of culture, gender, um, and just basic experiences. And, and um, more than one person working on a problem will come a better solution. Okay. Collaboration can help compensate for individual weaknesses. It's not strong in everything, but I have two things. If I have a partner who has the opposite strengths than I do, we can build a very powerful team. I see that happen a lot in my classroom when, um, you know, I might have a, a student who's very gifted in um, math and analytical thinking, but 
when it comes to creativity, they're horrible. And it's the person who uh, would rather do everything in pencil or black pen, no color, no creativity at all. If I put that person with someone who is creative and they can get the technical and the creative side together, their project is even better. Lastly, collaboration builds community. When we work on a problem together, we solve it together, and we build strong relationships. That's all good, but I'd like to give you two specific examples from, um, and a more recent example, in, uh, which illustrates the importance and effectiveness of collaboration. The first one is that of the Human Genome Project. This is their Genome Project. Um, uh, was started in the late 80s with the goal of sequencing the entire human genome, all of the members of the genetic uh, alphabet. It was a tremendous overwhelming task, which they expected to take well over a decade and to cost millions and millions of dollars. It was a very arduous process as they had to actually look up and catalog each individual letter in the building of um, genetic uh, letters. At the same time that um, a government agency, the Human Genome Project, was set up to uh, embark on this endeavor, a rival public company called Gentex was also uh, created. They set out to do the exact same thing, to sequence the entire human genome, but they were doing so for profit. Their goal was to sequence it and patent it so that they could develop drugs and other uh, therapies based on genome and make money off of it. So we have several uh, agencies, one which was public and all the data was published uh, publicly, and the other which was private. Now, typically, um, government is much slower and um, less nimble when it comes to uh, iterating and uh, uh, doing like this, and the industry is faster. But the, um, Francis Collins, the head of the Human Genome Project, realized um, the seriousness of the issue and um, the importance of getting the human genome into the public domain, not the private domain. And so he um, opened up access to the project to anyone with the interest and in ability to assist. And very quickly, they had um, labs from all over the world collaborating on this large, large task. At the end of the story, the Human Genome Project um, concluded in 2000, which they published their initial draft of the um, human genome, um, and it was completed um, budget and in less time than was anticipated. Now, the last time, I, I can't remember the last time that a government project has been under budget and ahead of schedule. That's just unbelievable. But it happens. And the reason was because of the collaboration between the labs all over the world. Over time, they developed better techniques to sequence the genome, um, uh, uh, more and more um, technical ability in that, and they became faster. The um, private company, Tech. Um, was much slower in their development because they didn't have the benefit of the great collaboration that the government um, agency did. So this illustrates, in my opinion, the necessity and the, um, the great potential that collaboration holds during this, this story. The second example that I have is a little more anecdotal and uh, comical, and all Google friends can probably hopefully tell some stories as well. This is a real device. This is called a conference bike. Um, I had the opportunity to visit the Googleplex in uh, Mountain View over the summer. And um, well, first thing I when you come on to campus is that there are bikes everywhere, literally everywhere. Not this one, but just, just bikes in general. Um, because the campus is so large and it takes so long to walk between buildings, um, they just have all these random bikes that you can pick up where you ever need to go and just leave it and somebody else picks it up and take it where they need to go. Um, it's, a, it's a great system. Well, somebody at Google uh, 
determined that this is a lot of wasted time because there were groups of employees traveling between office buildings, but it's not very easy to carry on a conversation when you're riding a bike. So they picked up a couple of the conference bikes. As you can see here, you can have um, up to six people sitting on one bike, um, having a conference or a meeting together as you travel between buildings. It's a really novel, great idea, but it uh, illustrates the importance that Google has placed on collaboration. If any of their tools, whether Gmail or Google Docs or Google Sites, you know that collaboration is one of the principles behind them. Collaboration is built into every single product and that um, carried out even further in the Google culture. This is all my opinion. Um, ISTE, which is a very well-known um, educational organization that um, has um, their standard technology standards for students and teachers and administrators, um, has identified collaboration as a key skill that students need to have. This is one of their standards that they publish for students. It says students um, need to use digital media and environments to communicate work collaboratively, including at a distance, to support in learning and contribute to the learning of others. So ISTE, which is um, one of the leading organizations in terms of technology standards, has identified collaboration as a critical skill for students. Take care of the why, now let's address what. What exactly is collaboration? I do over this or um, uh, much time on it. I think it's a pretty basic concept. Collaboration is simply two or more people or organizations working on a common goal and purpose. It can be very, very simple or um, very, very complex. It's, um, it just depends on um, the task at hand. But anytime two people sit down, they are collaborating. Even this meeting here today is a form of collaboration because I am sharing my ideas with you have a question and answer session at the end, and we'll share some ideas and thoughts that you have, and we'll learn from one another. There are means of collaboration, whether it's face-to-face -face discussion, two people sitting down having coffee together. Um, you can have group meeting, you know, team meeting. Um, we have a lot. Um, data, I know that in my AP biology class, we collect data in groups, and then each group reports back to me, I collect them into uh, you know, aggregate that data together, and then we aggregate data to draw our conclusions from. Organizations are um, set for collaboration. I recently attended the INA Call Distance Learning Conference in Arizona, and there was a gathering of 2,000 people um, all there to talk and discuss about online learning. Um, that was a form of collaboration. So it can be very simple. It can be a large group. Two or going to be just two people sitting down discussing an issue. The tools for collaboration. Here's just a very small list. Um, you see any of these are Google products. These tools are designed to let people communicate and collaborate with one another. Now, how to encourage collaboration in classrooms. Speaking specifically of science classrooms, but these principles can be applied to pretty much any type of classroom business or um, at the collegiate level. Collaboration is frequently informal. You don't overthink this. Um, students collaborate all the time. Someone calls you meeting, um, sharing your uh, homework uh, answers or test answers might argue is a form of collaboration, uh, maybe a healthy one, that is a form of collaboration. I, I know all the time students, you know, me and my after school will say, you know, what do we have to do today? What's, what the homework do we have? That is a form of creation. No hold them to do that. They just do it organically because they um, know it's helpful. One great way to encourage collaboration in your classroom is to divide your class up into smaller groups. Um, I find that small groups tend to foster collaboration a lot better than the larger group, just because it's so overwhelming. It takes a long time to establish, you know, who's kind of, kind of leader of the group. Divide them into smaller groups. Um, this happens a lot quicker. 
I around with the size of my lab groups. I have found that three is optimal with um, four being um, uh, well. If you give them four, what tends to happen is somebody is not involved because others are doing the work. If you have less than three, very one person will be absent and it's very difficult to collaborate by itself. So uh, three is my ideal. If I have a, an odd number of students, I, I kick it up to four. But um, that seems the best in um, my situation for lab groups anyways. When I make lead groups, um, I do try to make sure that they are academically mixed. I do not like this because they would much rather work on their own. That's because they can do the work by themselves and get done quickly. However, many A students um, struggle with the interpersonal st skills of working together in a group with a team, solving problems with other people, working through personality issues, things like that. It doesn't show up on the report card, but those are essential life skills that they do need to work on. Um, students love this because um, it gives an opportunity to be successful, and they can learn from the A students. So, um, caution, um, I change my groups quarterly. Um, I switch them up and try to give a mix of students. Um, and when you do this, share, don't keep it a secret. Tell students what you're doing, that you're creating, um, you can even call them you know, collaborative groups if you don't want to call them lab groups. Um, so that uh, students know uh, their purpose and know they are a team working together trying to solve the problems that you give them. Don't be able to introduce a little competition into your classroom for the lab group that gets the best data or the group that produces the best project or finishes uh, first. Um, that will all them together as a team and help to work together. You have to work on developing a collaborative language um, so that students use the word collaboration, that they understand that they are collaborating and know that this is an important skill. Um, I have uh, five essential skills that I teach in my uh, class. These are not um, content-related skills. This is just general life skills, uh, including data analysis, uh, study skills, uh, and one of them is collaboration. I talk about it regularly as we've already discussed, to define what constitutes collaboration and what constitutes cheating. Uh, my class, the basic rule that I have is um, if answer is a uh, rote answer, meaning if it's a definition, if it's a number, if it's a fill and length type of thing, you're welcome to collaborate and share those answers with one another. If an answer needs to be more dynamic and personal, meaning you have to analyze, synthesize, compare and control, I'm expecting more of an explanation from you, then you're allowed to collaborate. Each person needs to have a, their own unique answer. And if I have two answers that are the same, that's cheating and not acceptable. This is a principle that applies to pretty much anything. If you want to encourage a student to do something, put them for it. Um, it's a hundred times better than criticism. Criticizing the group that is fighting not collaborating together, shout praise on the group that is, and the group that um, is difficult will see that and um, hopefully gravitate, you know, the praised qualities rather than the, the negative. Going over the um, why of collaboration, we looked at um, the what and how. I'd like to share with you some. Specifics, um, some specific ideas on how to encourage collaboration in your classroom through specific projects. Some of the things that I've done in my classroom, some are things that I'm currently working on, and some are ideas that I hope to um, incorporate into the future. So I have five of them. We'll go through them quickly, and I'll share some resources with you, and then we'll open it up for questions. The first is student generated surveys. And this is the perfect um, tool for uh, Google Docs, specifically Google Spreadsheets and Forms. Um, what I really try to help my students develop is data analysis. Collect 
analyze, interpret uh, data. And there's a better way to do that than to collect your own. So you can encourage your students to set a research problem in which they come up with a, some type of scenario. They create a survey using um, Google Docs uh, form, and then they take the data from that form and um, create graphs and um, come kind of up with some um, answers uh, to explain it. There's various things that you can do to collect this data. I really like the simplicity and um, reliability of Google Docs. Is that um, I do have a my school a Google Apps school, so that integrated into our um, our tools uh, and um, it's, it's easy to use. A couple of examples that um, I have, um, I had a student named Justin last year sent out a survey on reducing the smoking age. Um, his argument um, uh, was that students should um, be able to smoke um, earlier, um, that they're responsible enough to do that. Not surely agree, but that was his research project, and he sent that out to people. Great that is to just um, send out the link through Twitter and Facebook. That's what we did, and um, he got quite a few, probably 20, 25 um, responses from that. I had, um, recently, who um, did an IQ test um, and uh, sent that out, and then was looking at how grade point average and um, family situation impacts intelligence. And then a nice example that I'll with you is um, a fifth grade recycling sur survey conducted by a uh, teacher in my school. I'm going to switch to my companion website here and show you that survey. So on the left side, I've got all of my various um, products and then links to them. And I'm just going to click on the grade recycling survey. I think this is the easy the results. Um, the table is called What's Been in Your Bin. This is the survey itself. I think it's still up. The teacher with her fifth grade class, they came up, they came up with the questions. Um, they created a Google form and they sent that out and they got a ton of responses. And then they just um, analyzed those responses, which I think I can pull up. Um, here are their responses, where they're from. We've got a nice Google map there, so all over the world. This one is posted on um, the companion site, and you're welcome to uh, view their responses. Um, really survey, a uh, great example of using uh, Google Docs school forms with uh, an elementary class. for you to make this successful. Um, make sure you teach a difference between quantitative and qualitative data. In um, the that uh, students of mine have completed, um, I'll be honest with you in saying that um, their setup and data collection techniques were very poor. So they need a lot of instruction as far as that I want to with that question. Um, a lot of times they don't think through the process. You know, what type of data am I going to get if this is a question I ask? Is data going to give me the, what I need to answer whatever my question is? Um, a lot of, uh, I had a student recently who put together a form, sent it out, got responses back, and pretty much concluded that, yeah, this is completely useless because it doesn't help me answer my question. So learning process. There's no wrong with that, um, but they really need a lot of assistance in thinking through what is a reliable question. Am I, what kind of types of answers am I going to get from this type of question? Is that what I want to do? How am I going to analyze these things? I mentioned Facebook and Twitter, great way to get surveys out to the masses. Anytime I see someone tweet out um, or a question, they'll take the survey from my student. I always try to take it because I've done the same and I appreciated when uh, they took my, my survey. So um, kind of a, you scratch back, my back, I'll scratch your type thing. thing is um, a lot of reflection does come from the process rather than the 
conclusion of the survey. As I mentioned, why students um, end up not their data because it's not they expected. But that's part of the learning process. We're back to um, these collaborative surveys in a little bit. Um, it doesn't have to do with data and all of these things kind of revolve around uh, Google Forms. So the um, project that I'd like to share with you is class data analysis. And this is using Google uh, Forms. This is great for quantitative labs, um, the meter for an AP class. Um, an individual lab group conducts an experiment with data. That data may or may not be reliable. When you aggregate that data with a whole bunch of other data, um, you begin to see trends. And your class data analysis really helps students see the value and importance of repeat trials and long-term um, experiments. If one group might get this totally wacky thing happen in one of their experiments, it rolls off all of their data. You put it in with the rest of the group, and that blip kind of um, gets minimized. I had been doing class data analysis without the collaborative power and tools of Google Docs, whether it's Docs itself, spreadsheets, forms. Um, it just makes this so much easier to do. A um, real example here is this is um, the uh, end lab that I did. And let me try to play this. See how it comes through. I'll let this uh, itself. Posted on the um, uh, the site uh, that I shared, and uh, I'll just let you go and look on that. That you sit there, there and with for the here is the classic two ticket uh, enzyme lab, which illustrates um, how enzymes react under different conditions, whether they're deeper, uh, a couple other conditions. Equal lab group test one condition, and then we um, add all those conditions together, and we're able to um, see if I can show the graph uh, data, and um, it shows up beautifully just in terms of how um, that time would act on those conditions. Um, give yeah, give it, uh, just what you expect. So uh, an example that I think really helped them grasp the importance of enzymes and how they're impacted by different conditions. of class data analysis, I recommend these docs can get, you know, I think the max for collaborators on docs is like 500. Um, you can do this with a lot of class. If you have a one to one school or can um, check out a laptop cart, give one laptop each group. Um, as, um, the groups are collecting their data, they put it into a spreadsheet. Um, it's a spreadsheet data from the entire group. And then if you go and set up your formulas ahead of time, you can take averages um, of, and then out or just share that document with your students and then go home and graph and draw conclusions from it. Really um, nice. Great uh, opportunity to teach the skills of graphing. 
I always teach my students how to do it by hand, just using graph paper before do the graph from the computer. So all first semester um, we did a band, and then probably second semester I'll have them start doing some uh, graphing on the computer. Um, another great opportunity to explain the importance of collaboration. Say we did not um, attempt to add our data together. One one lab um, results could throw off the group's data, and they might come up with the wrong conclusion. And you can all you should spend a lot of time looking and reviewing those graphs, saying, you know, this is what we saw. These are the conclusions that we drew. Was that correct? are there errors? Experiments that we could correct um, to make sure that our data is better. Really cool visualization tools, gadgets in uh, speed that you can um, explore um, if your students are up for it. Let me see, I think I've got a quick video uh, there. Yeah, we'll leave this one real quick. Uh, uh, time out. That shows, um, you know, uh, this is population data over time. Um, I believe it's popular. Um, and so you can see the different color presents the different trees and how their population has changed over time. So you could do this if um, you had data that was appropriate for it. There's lots of documentation on how to use these, which really puts uh, anything that moves, um, makes it cool for students. A few. Um, um, things uh, for um, graph creators, motion chart, gadget, uh, which you just saw, a couple of um, options for creating concept maps, um, video that I just uh, showed part of, as well as my tips and some uh, other links. So feel free to use that as you wish. Collaborative tool, um, class data analysis. Let's go on to one um, journal summaries. This one has a lot of um, there's a lot of different directions you could take this. I'll share my specific with you, and then you can um, apply your situation. Basically, uh, what I did is uh, when I studied genetics, and I think this year was the third year I've done this, we could be changing topics, and even textbooks can't keep up with the advancements that are taking place. I have students read or find. Um, um, journals, news reports related to discoveries related to just and they all have something stem research or cloning or genetic modified food, something like that. I read it and then I have them summarize the article in, you know, past, um, and then they post that some on um, several years ago before Google Sites was um, as good as it is now. So I'm using Wikispaces um, in summary, and then students cut to respond to uh, their uh, original post. Way to get students to read current scientific research, uh, something they might not normally do. Um, it also teaches just basic virtual discussion board skills. Um, which is one I, I know in the state of Michigan, all students are required to have some form of online learning experience. This how to formulate an original and then how to reply appropriately to other students is really important. So we have to go beyond just the, hey, that was really cool, I really liked your article type post and post something um, substantive. So the application for Wiki, whether it's Wikispaces or Google Sites, which could also work um, for all. Um, so uh, it's called Genetics in the News. I switch over and show what that looks like. And I'm to the uh, website I could Go to Journal Summaries, and here's one two. School Wiki, and um, you can see this was last year. So um, it's three articles and respond to them. And then here's the, the link with all the articles you saw. Um, just go ahead and pick one here. You can have any questions. Try to put uh, some discussions on it. The editor applies to the student who comes up with the uh, 
comes up the discussion uh, that has the, the most discussions on it. Um, yeah, there's no good one here. Oops, that one's not going to work. Um, so all of these are original student summaries, which the hosts, and then um, they're also um, required to respond to another student. Um, the discussion test. Um, see I also posted another example from my AP class, the summer discussion. And this one I am using Google Sites for. Um, I'm not real pleased with the um, discussion options within Google Sites. It's a threaded discussion. It's more of a blog-based um, discussion or a comment feature. However, there are some nice links which you can in. Um, this that I found here um, that you can just you can stick a thread discussion into a Google site. So this is from our students who are required to do some reading and then post and um, you can see the post here. So an option as well. The nice thing about, about all the project that they're Integrated so sites and docs and calendar, everything works really well together. So it is nice to stay within the uh, Google family. Both are here, so you're free to reference them in the future. Questions? Um, when I do this, especially for my genetics in the news assignment, I, I cut up, set up a custom search engine to improve the quality of the articles. I don't want students going out and finding um, if that's not accurate or it's really old um, or big. And so I have, um, I defied probably up to 25 or so um, different sites that I deemed value for this assignment. And I create a search engine so that students use that and they only get um, sites that from these sites and therefore are more likely to be reliable, uh, valid, and quality that I am expecting. Uh, taking time to develop um, certain tools collab as well. So if you're working within a team at a goal, especially in the elementary and middle school, you can work together to create a list of sites or maybe even your um, list may have some. With this, it is very important that you model the process with them the first time. When I teach this, the first thing I do is show them how to post and how to comment in class. Um, just me doing it and they watching the time, uh, the first post, we go to the computer lab and do that together. Uh, and then the second, third time, they're on their own. They can do it from home. Um, I did not do this, and it was a disaster. It was a waste of time. Models first. The good news is if you use Google products regularly, a lot of it is the same between the sites, apps, or We lost John for a second on the um, on the call. So uh, we'll try to connect again. Please hold.
right now, um, and so we should be up and running in um, a minute. All right, I'm back. Great. <laughs> Stop that. I don't know what happened. I was just, I was in and I was gone. So. No, worries, no worries. <laughs> We're all still here. All right. All right. Rob, I apologize, everybody. Um, I think I, I know where we were. Uh, so I cut off there. Uh, we're just finishing up sort of the journal assignments. Um, I really don't have too much uh, else to uh, add to that. Um, Resources are there. You can uh, reference them as you need to. A couple more. Um, this one, uh, next one is a beta project. Um, I have not um, done this in students yet. Um, I am testing it personally, trying to figure out the best way to do it. But I really think that it has some great, um, has great potential. Um, and that's multimedia lab reports. Lab reports right now are primarily paper based. It's I give them the lab instructions, some pre-lab questions, some um, collect data during the lab, and then post-lab analysis questions. It's all right. It gets the job done, but it's not very interesting. I am a creative person by design. I love the creativity aspect of science. Um, that's really where I try to focus my energies. So with this idea, um, when the iPod Touch um, added a camera to it, and I picked one up, and I'm trying it out myself, trying to figure out what what maps to work um, with it. But the basic idea is instead of doing a paper-based project, I have students with iPod Touch actually record um, pictures, video of themselves doing the lab, collect data using the iPod Touch in conjunction with Google Docs spreadsheets, which now that um, Google has um, added the uh, Apple product uh, function to that, it works works great. You can edit spreadsheets and docs on your uh, phone, iPod, iPad. It works awesome. I need authoring. enables allows them to be creative um, uh, and share their work with other people. They can post it on YouTube, TeacherTube, or um, you know any of the other um, sites. So the basic of it, um, we're using Google Docs. Um, you've also got the iMovie app that you can use to edit video, um, and then you can stick the thing onto YouTube. Each lab group could have their own YouTube account, or if you've got a school YouTube account, you can do it that way, or Vimeo, or um, whatever. If you're Google Apps, you've got to, um, your Google account internally that you can use. That's a great way to do it as well. So I'm excited about this. Um, like I said, it does need some more development. I've identified a fact apps that I think are helpful. Wikipedia is great. gives you some basic stuff. You've got Wolf and Metal, which helps with calculations. Uh, always need a basic calculator, lab timer. Google is great. Their app is wonderful. Um, 
Uh, this is great if you're doing something related to geography, even evolution. Um, you can, I like I some stuff with um, Darwin uh, when we do evolution. Um, his voyage of the, uh, on the Beagle. You can trace around using Google um, Earth on your flight pad. So, so a really, um, I'm excited about this one. I think it has some great potential. Still work, don't have a lot of examples to share with you. I've shared some resources related to iPads, iPods, um, and some app science classrooms. But you can just stay tuned. I developed this one and uh, results. Uh, as that I'd like to share with you before we open it up to questions. This is another one I'm really excited about, and I'll be um, using this one after uh, Christmas vacation with my students. The infographics. Um, graphics. I am not um, a person. I, I don't think in terms of mathematics. I think in terms of um, linguistics. I love language. Um, but I am a teacher. So infographics kind of combine the best parts of data and art. So visual and students um, tend to like as well. This is a great add-on to the student-generated surveys that we uh, first. So if you have students create a collect data, the culminating project or part of their project could be an infographic. That's one way to display the information that you've um, gathered. We we'll create lab groups that um, have a variety of different um, uh, minds and learning styles in them. You've got your math um, quiz and you've got your art quiz. In the same group, given this, they will do a great job because it's a combination of math, science, and art and design. It's really nice. Everybody an opportunity to be successful. If you've seen an infographic, um, I'll share a couple of my favorites with you. This one here I really love. Um, these are the number of men in the United States who will die in, this was 2008, as a result of, and then a whole bunch of things. So and everything from cancer, um, to fall cliff, to lightning strikes, you can see it there, and then the whole thing um, makes the image of a skull. So you're combining ground elements with data. I really like this one a lot. Here's the one not quite as cool. These are um, selling movies and most pirated. I'm pairing the two, you know, movie sales from um, revenue from piracy. Pretty not not too bad. Um, this is one here uh, of energies uh, across the world. You know which countries are using which type of renewable energy sources, and you can see like uh, fuel gauges, which is kind of nice. So again, blending art and design. I'll share one that I made um, last year. Uh, at the end of every year, I create a um, evaluation form using Google Docs that I share with my students and I have them tell you know their experience in my class. Whether it was easy, medium, hard, if they had a good time, if they liked it, you know, yeah, um, eye opening experience. It's it's humbling but uh, good to do every year. I also have them uh, describe the class in one word and you can see I just stuck those um, submissions into Wordle and uh, got that word map there. So you can see if you're familiar at all with Google Forms, you recognize these graphs because all I did was pull them off of the um, summary from my um, uh, spready. So really to do, this would be infographic, um, and this would be the kind of thing that I would have my students do as well. Um, interesting to have an entire class use the same data, data infographics, and just see different types and um, ways of displaying that information that you can come up with. Kind of a neat way to um, just creativity go. I would probably start with that so that they get the idea of you know, what an infographic is and kind of basic technique to them. So I encourage uh, you to have them search the web for infographics, find really like, and then kind of model their first one off of that 
that one just to get them started. And I've posted a lot of um, links to really good ones that I have found. Your Google infographic and Google presentation or using the drawing tools. Um, great way to just kind of copy and paste different elements from the web or from their um, graph and their forms. Um, they run that collaboratively, so each person assembles a different part on a different slide, and then they can put the whole thing together. Um, it gives um, an opportunity to discuss the use of data to um, the, uh, you know, the saying is, you know, libraries use numbers. And you can skew data. You can make it say what you want it to say. So maybe take some popular infographics and say, well, how are they displaying this? Does the data reflect the conclusion that they're drawing? So again, it's a nice opportunity to discuss big issues outside of just the content area. These are beautiful pieces, and um, I'd highly recommend displaying them on a blog, wiki, um, um, tool so that we can, uh, so others can see them as well. If you please, I'd love to see what you come up with. Um, I really um, proceed to send me a link. That's basics. Um, we've talked about why collaboration is important because it gets things done. It helps, helps um, uh, chances. It reveals new perspectives. We talked about what collaboration is. It's just two people, two or more people working on a common project towards a common toward a couple. We talked how to encourage collaboration. One of the keys is just encourage. And then I've shared five ideas that um, you could use to um, start collaborating in your classroom um, very soon. Google products shared um, resources. Again, those are all on the uh, companion website. And um, I can zoom on that, give you the address one more time. And then uh, We'll open it up for questions. So bear with me here. Uh, website is bit.ly stem collaboration. And uh, you can also see my email and uh, Twitter address there. You're welcome to contact me as you like. Are any questions? Great, John. That was really helpful. You shared a ton of um, great resources. And we do have a few questions. So um, for those of you who are still listening, please put your questions in the Q&A um, box in your WebEx, and um, we will go ahead and answer them online. Um, if we start running out of time um, and we're not able to uh, answer all the questions, we will send <coughs> Excuse me, we will send out a link to um, the Q&A transcript, so you'll be able to, you know, read the answers to your questions then. But um, for now, let's go with some of the questions we have. So the first one is, um, you know, did you say that there was a way to add threaded discussions to sites? Yes. Uh, let me pull up. Um, so on my website here, um, journal summaries, let me open up my AP course. I did this in summary, but bear with me a minute. Um, and this is called, I'm going to have to log in, so hang on just a second. It's a gadget. It's not a native um, Google product. So I'll pull that up and see. Um, while I'm doing this, some, what other questions do we have? Yeah, um, what, what, so I guess another question was, um, how do you, I guess, differentiate between like cheating and collaborating? What are the key things or key points that you use to differentiate the two? Yeah, the basic, the big rule that I have is that um, in answer is supposed to be the same for every student. Um, fill in the blank type. They don't mind if they you know divide it up and um, you know say one through four. I'll take five through eight. I don't care if they do that. They're all get the same answer. I'm more concerned with them winning the answer. If the question is more of a, 
a um, entrance question where they have to, um, you know, turn contract or you know, get a pin. That has to be their original response. So the basic. Um, okay, great. Um, another question is, are you able to access Twitter and Facebook since social networking sites and much else are filtered? Are they filtered for your district? Yes, um, they're all filtered. However, the students always go home and use them. So we don't use them in school, but they all have their own accounts. And when they go home, I tell them, you know, they access it on their phone, honestly. So um, we access Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, directly via um, in class, but at home. Um, so tell them to do it then. Um, great. Right, um, what resources can you provide for setting up a custom search engine? Um, that's a good one. I I can't remember if I've done a blog post on that or not. Um, there's pretty good documentation, and honestly, it's really simple. Um, the URL. I think it. I'll find it for you. We can't, you know, answer right off the bat. We, we will put in the question and answer transcript. So you'll be sure. Able to URL is google.com slash CSE. And I, I really think that if you just go there and click through, you'll find it. It's really nice. So it enables you to create an embeddable search engine. So um, a, uh, a sign on genetics. We went with a, a, um, a wait list search engine, so I selected the sites that the search engine looks at. You can also blacklist search engines, so it will exclude sites that you know are either inappropriate or just not reliable. You know, don't want them to use Wikipedia. You can blacklist it. So a lot of options, a lot of granularity, and like I mentioned, it, it's um, collaborative. So you can share a search engine with multiple people. And can add and subtract sites as well. It's really a great tool. Awesome. Um, another attendee wants to know what site do you use to create an infographic? Well, um, there's no specific site. It's graphic design. So any um, design product you use. As far as Google products go, I think that Google presentation would be the best. Just it's um, object oriented, so you can drag images and pictures and text and replace them as you want. Um, certainly the drawing um, feature within Google Docs. But you can use Publisher, you can use Photoshop, as you make it as complicated um, as you want. Do you have any suggestions for elementary and middle? School grades. What about students that lack computers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, a question that comes up a lot. It is always an issue. There, there's always, it seems, one student that either doesn't have a computer at home or more and doesn't have um, internet at home. So most of the work that I do is in class, and we do have so computer labs at my school. So they really, if they do it at home, they have to do it in the computer lab. Um, did you run, so on that note, did you run, in, run into any security or parental issues when you first started? Um, not serious. Um, I have a couple when um, I post some of my lectures on YouTube and ask students to watch them. Um, I once said, you know, I don't want my kid on YouTube. Um, we've, I've always found a workaround for I find that as long as you're front in your communication, you typically won't have um, any issues. Um, if you're school, hopefully we'll have a good um, theft or use policy and you know, clear lines for what is and is not acceptable. Um, and that will kind of be a safeguard for you. 
end of the letter home to parents, um, say, oh, we're going to use Google Apps. This is what they'll have access to. If you have any questions, give me a call. So um, just up front, and I think uh, you'll avoid. Um, yeah. I was answering other questions. This is the um, uh, plugin, the gadget for uh, Google Keep that allows you to do embeddable um, threaded discussions. It's called Talky. Um, that KI uh, plugins, um, they've got them for WordPress and um, the Google Sites one. So it's in the Google Gadget directory and that sticks right into um, the site. The thing is they do for authentication through Google. So students have to create a new username and password. They can log in using their no password or through Google Apps. Um, their regular Google Apps login. Great. Do you personally use the video chat Google application? I do personally. Um, students, um, we don't set up, and honestly, it's just more work than I want to do. <laughs> personally work with you know schools and school districts all over the country. We generally don't see um full time chat for their students. So um something to keep in mind. Um, and so then uh, another question is just in general about Google Apps, um is it do you feel like it's appropriate for first grade? Could you see you know first graders doing projects like these? Big question. Um I would say that at first grade it might be a little bit over um, the amount of administrative work you're going to have to do to get everyone an account, and then and, you know, it's hard enough to get my students in high school to remember their usernames and passwords. So I can only imagine that in first grade that would be a little more difficult. Uh, so I probably wouldn't do individual accounts for students. Um, I want to create just like a class set, so just student one, student two, student three, etc. And uh, use a class, you know, for logins to if you want to do a collaborative document for one class period. The teacher in my school who um, did the recycling bin survey, fifth grade, they did it together. So they came up with the questions, but she actually was the one who typed them up. Um, they shared it, and then shared the data with them, and then they, they discussed it. So it was more of a class project rather than an individual one. Yeah, from that a little bit more. It's I, you know, I've seen um, you know districts where pre kindergartners they have all have Google Apps accounts, uh, and so it just depends on which apps you're using um, for the students. And I'll post actually a link to a video where a first grade classroom is using some of the tools in Google Apps. Obviously not as advanced as the resources that John with us today, but there are ways uh, to incorporate the apps in in primary classroom. Um, so we're running out of time, and I just want to go go through a, a couple more questions really quickly. Um, uh, we'll just you know, um, end with this one. So how have your students you know, taken to this? Do they enjoy this part of the classwork and do they do their homework more frequently? So you know, what's the impact on student learning that you found? Um, at first, everyone's really excited because they're cool tools and it's fun to do. But then they realize that it is work. Um, and it is, you know, it's it's work. It's the same work. It's just, just a different way of doing it. Now, hopefully, it enables them to do some things, more interesting things, and helps them develop skills. Um, but uh, it is a challenge. I mean, you still have I still have kids who do their work, um, and I have, have um, some. Of it. One thing to say though is that a student who normally does very well. In additional classroom, just with analog type projects, they can still be successful. But a lot of students who struggle with, you know, paper-based projects. When I do computer-based things using Google Apps or other things, they thrive. Uh, just with the discussion board types things, you have a student who you never hear from in the classroom. They never answer questions. They never join the discussion. You put them online in a chat room or on a discussion board, and they are always posting. So it's it really nice to be able to give students 
an opportunity to be successful in a different type of environment. And you find that different students will thrive um, in those environments. Cool. Well, thank you, John, for you know, hosting this webinar and giving us all these resources. Um, you know, I, I learned a lot, and I'm sure um, all of our attendees did as well. And, and we'll be sending out the recorded version of the webinar and the uh, um, chat transcript. So, um, you know, until next time, you know, I hope you guys learned something new today. Thank you again, John. Thanks.